The Zodiac murders started in 1966. The killer sent cryptic letters to the San Francisco Chronicle. The letters rambled. They hinted at Satanism. This was a composite drawing of a suspect who was never caught. Unforbidden. Truth. I'm, 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 Unforbidden. Truth. I'm, 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 Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. Today I'll be speaking with the New York Zodiac copycat killer, Eriberto Eddie Seda. Eddie is a Leo. He was born July 31st, 1967, in New York City, New York. Eddie grew up living with his mother and his half-sister, Gladys Chachi Reyes. In November 1989, a letter was sent to the New York Police Department from what seemed to be the California Zodiac killer, The letter read, This is the Zodiac. The twelfth sign will die when the belts in heaven are seen. The first sign is dead on March 8th, 1990. 1.45 a.m. White man with cane. Shoot on the back. In the street. The second sign is dead on March 29th, 1190. 2.57 a.m. White man with black coat. Shoot in the side. In front of house. The third sign is dead on May 31st, 1990. 2.04 a.m. White old man with cane. Shoot in front of house. Signed off with, no more games, pigs. I'll shoot in Brooklyn with 380 RNL or 9mm. No grooves on bullet. On March 8, 1990, as stated in the letter to police, the first of many shootings that would be attributed to the New York Zodiac took place. Mario Orozco was shot in his back. The bullet stayed lodged in his spine. He survived the attack. On March 29, 1990, another shooting took place. Jermaine Montensdro was shot in the left torso of his lower body. The bullet went through his liver. He survived the shooting. On May 31st, 1990, Joseph Prost was shot in his lower back. The bullet hit his kidney, and though he survived the shooting, he later died of his injuries in the hospital on June 24th, 1990, making this the New York Zodiac's third victim, being the first to die from their injuries. Another letter was sent to the New York Post in the production office of the CBS News program 60 Minutes in June of 1990. On June 19th, 1990, Larry Perham was shot in the chest, surviving his attack. The bullet missed his aorta and exited his body through his right armpit. On August 10th, 1992, Patricia Font was shot twice and stabbed over a hundred times, making her the second confirmed murder victim of the New York Zodiac Killer. A little less than a year later, on June 4th, 1993, James Weber was shot in the buttocks, surviving his attack. On July 20th, John Diacone was shot in the head at close range. He was killed instantly. On October 2nd, 1993, Diane Ballard was shot in the neck, surviving her attack. The bullet had missed her vital arteries, but lodged against her spine. Before his next and final attack, Eddie was arrested in March 1994 for possession of a deadly weapon after police noticed a suspicious bulge in his jacket pocket that had one of his zip guns concealed in it. After police determined that the gun was non-functional, his public defender got all charges dropped and his arrest record was sealed. On June 18, 1996, the reign of terror that the New York Zodiac was inflicting on New York City came to an end when Gladys Reyes, Eddie's half-sister, was shot in the buttocks after he had a confrontation with her and her boyfriend. Gladys had been wounded but she wasn't incapacitated, so she ran to her neighbor's house and called 911. After a few hours of a standoff with police, Eddie gave up six firearms and was arrested. After his arrest, authorities didn't make the link between the New York Zodiac and Eddie until his handwritten statement about what happened with his sister and boyfriend was taken. When Eddie gave his statement to police on the incident with his sister and her boyfriend, he used a symbol in his statement identical to one that was in the taunting letters that was sent to the police and media. Law enforcement was able to use toolmark evidence to link Eddie to the crimes. Fingerprint evidence was also found, and handwritten analysis determined a strong similar between his handwritten statement and the anonymous letters that were sent to police and the media. The most damning piece of evidence against Eddie was DNA that was found on one of the stamps he had used to mail a letter to police. After these findings, Eddie was charged with a New York Zodiac string of shootings. He had disruptions in court having outbursts and shouting at the judge at one point. On June 24th, 1998, Eriberto Seda was convicted on multiple counts of murder, attempted murder, and criminal possession of a firearm. He was sentenced to 232 years in prison. At some point during his incarceration, Eddie began having a relationship with another notorious murderer by the name of Cynthia China Blast, 
whom is a transgender woman, a member of the Latin Kings, who served in 25 to life for the rape and torture of a 13-year-old girl, Nicole Williams, a teenage girl from Harlem, New York. Here's my interview with the New York Zodiac Killer, Eriberto Eddie Seda. In collect call from Eddie. An incarcerated individual at New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Where were you born? Um, Brooklyn, New York. Can you recall your first positive memory as a child? Um, I don't think so. Not, not really. Or any positive memories from your childhood, for that matter? Well, I mean, probably normal. I mean, I don't know what, what by positive means. I mean, I just grew up. I mean, I grew up in a poor neighborhood and stuff like that. What about your first negative memory as a child? Can you recall your first negative memory or a negative memory that sticks out to you? Well, other than, you know, being in the neighborhood, there's always a lot of crime and drug dealing and stuff like that. That's like one of the most positive that stand out. Always have problems in the neighborhood with drugs and shootings and just, just chaos, you know? Were your parents together throughout your childhood? Now, um, I grew up with my uh, mother, a single parent. Were you close with her growing up? Yeah, yeah, because it was nobody else, you know. Do you have any siblings? Yeah, uh, I got uh, three sisters. Three sisters? Yes. Were you close with any of them growing up? Oh, uh, not really, because uh, when, like, growing up, you know, we we, we were kids, but uh, um, one of them moved out, like, when she was a teenager, and the other one, I never knew her, but because she went to live in Puerto Rico with, with different relatives, and I really never knew her, you know? Do you wish you would have got the opportunity to have a relationship with your sisters growing up? Yeah, I would, but because, you know, the... The condition we lived in, you know, neighborhood being poor and everything, everything just didn't work out the way, you know, everybody wants it to work out, you know. You know, have a nice everything, you know. What were some of your hobbies as a child? Well, one of my hobbies I could recall, I used to um, build models, put them together, model kits, pieces, and then you put them together with, uh, with glue. That's one of my earlier models, and I guess because uh, doing that, and I guess time went on, and you know, doing my crime, because I made uh, zip guns. I guess that made it easy for me to uh, to create it because I was I was already used to putting stuff together and building building stuff like the, the plastic plastic models. So were you creating those zip guns as a kid? And if so, what age were you you know building those at? Well, I mean, well, it all started because, you know, I was in high school, like I told you before, and I brought a startup pistol, and they called me, and then they kicked me out of school, and then I was, you know, I was, in, you know, in my apartment doing nothing, and so I decided, I'm, and I wanted to join the Army and do something. I took the test, and I could pass it by two or three points, you know, and that got me angry, pissed off. I said, well, you know, I can't join the Army, you know, nothing, and, I, you know, because before... I, you know, I wanted to go to the Army. I wanted to get as much information as I can, you know, books, you know, everything, how to, how to you know, how the Army works, every, every, you know, weapons and everything like that. And 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 I, I went, then I went to take the test, but I couldn't take the test, and I was just angry and in my house, and I didn't know what to do. And one day, I just looked at the TV show, and I said, I want to, you know, do something, and I'm going to take the Zodiac identity from California. And I took it and I started planning and planning and started building the, the zip gun and testing them. I was testing them in my apartment. I was testing them in, in the parks at night. This was all as a teenager that you became obsessed with the well, Zodiac? I, mean, I, I, mean, I don't know how old I was. I haven't... Uh, what age was I? Probably... Uh, I haven't think about what, uh, 1988, late 1980, 88, 89? I don't know, how, how old was I? Was I? <laughs> what I've read about you is that I've read that you were obsessed with Ted Bundy, a serial killer, and serial killers in general uh, when you were growing up. Is there any truth to that? Yeah. No, I'm not obsessed with them. 
dumb, you know. I just examine, you know, their crimes, how the police investigate, stuff like that. Because I was looking into the, you know, the, the, you know, the techniques you know, that both sides uses, like who who's better than the other one, or any flaws on both sides, and you get hints on what you know what I could do, do right or not do, you know, wrong. You know, I'm not, you know, really, you know, there's no worry that like, you know, I'm obsessed with for anything, like you know, like I put them on a on my pedestal or anything like that. I just focus on the crime, you know, how they did it, if they did mistakes, or the police. How, how they find, you know, how they find people so that way they won't, they won't catch me, you know? So when you were a teenager, you know, researching and exploring all these people that committed all these horrible crimes, did you, at that point in time, at that age, did you want to be like one of them, have that, you know, notoriety and, you know, infamy and be in the headlines and did that appeal to you? Um, probably a little bit, but more of, of them recognizing me than, than, you know, than the publicity, you know. You're you know, talking like, about other like, infamous like, killers recognizing you? No, 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 no. We're talking about, like, the, like, the people recognizing, like, like, I'm here because, you know, it's like, you know, you can't do nothing. And, like, you know, join the army, do nothing and nothing. And it's like, you know, like, is anybody out there, like, you know that I'm here? Like, you know, you know, I, I want to do something and, like, you can't do nothing. No, you can't join the army, you can't do nothing. And it's like I'm invisible. Like, nobody sees me, you know. And I wanted, like, people to know, like, I'm here, you know? Look, look, I could do something, you know? I mean, it was the wrong thing to do, but uh, that's what I wanted people to, like, like see, like, look, I'm here, you know? So basically, so people couldn't ignore your existence? Yeah, but to be recognized, like, I'm here, like, you know, like, you know, pay attention to me or something. So were you lacking that when you were younger, you think? Attention and affection from... I, I know you said you were just with your mother, so there was no father in the picture. Uh -huh. I mean, not, not really. You know, like, like I told you, I mean, we we close. You know, we we grew up in uh, in a you know in a bad environment. But I guess just being kicked out of school and and not joining army, not really doing nothing because I grew up poor. There's not really no 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 support like in the neighborhood. And you know, we grew up in in welfare, so it was kind of difficult. But it was like you know, it was hard you know to uh, get anything done. You know, there's no. Like, we didn't have, like, places to go or people to talk to, so we just, you know, I grew up in a more, like, isolated, you know? Mm. Can you recall if you suffered any childhood abuse or trauma? Mm, not that I could ever recall, no. Other than being in, a, in the environment, you know, with all the crimes and drugs and everything in the, in the building. Like seeing people, what, just, like, strung out on drugs in front of you? Uh, that using selling and you know there was a couple of shootings people got shot you know in the in the building. Did you ever witness any shootings or see any dead bodies or? No, just seen you know the shots, keeping the shots, and they coming to get them. What was your behavior like growing up, going back as early as you can remember? Well, mostly I, I, I went to school. I, was, I always had perfect attendance. I always got an award every year for perfect attendance. I always get a whole bunch of, you know, they always get the, from like uh, high school and down, I always got like the perfect attendance and I always got like a little piece of medal award. How would you say your behavior was primarily in school, you know, elementary, middle school, and high school up until you were 16? I, mean, I was perfect. I mean, I, uh, I did all the classes. I, I, I behaved myself. I did everything. It's like any other normal kid. It's just somehow, you know, that that incident that in high school, I bumped that startup pistol. During that startup pistol, they, they called me, and somehow that started the downfall. Like, everything is, just went haywire, you know? Why did you bring it to school? Were you thinking of attacking it's, somebody? It's or? So I guess just showing off, you know, like showing all these other kids, like I started to do, and you know, and they caught me with it, and I got kicked out of school, and everything just went down the tube after that. How would you say that your home life was like throughout your entire childhood? I mean, not all three sisters was there. I mean, one I never knew. You know, she moved to she moved to Puerto Rico, you know, to live with other relatives. So I never, I never, knew, I never knew that one at any any time. So mm -hmm. I really know, never seen or talked. And, you know, I don't even know if she's still alive, you know? Hmm. You know? And then another one, she left, like, when she was, like, uh, in her teenagers. 
And then the other one, like, you know, she uh, she was there when she was um, growing up. Hmm. And that was Gladys? Yeah. Hmm. It was the last one there. Were you and your family religious growing up? Uh, I mean, my, my mother always go to, uh, I mean, she was religious, but not as much, but she would go, like, um, Palm Sundays to, you know, to church and get the palms and stuff, you know, here and there. Hmm. What was your relationship like with Gladys as you grew older in your teenage years? I remember reading something about an incident or incidents of you becoming physical with her. Yeah, I mean, it's always funny because as she got to her, to her teenage years, uh, she always started to uh, hang around with, you know, with other teenagers and not really paying attention to her mother and and hanging around and bringing them over to the apartment, like it's a hangout and stuff like that, which, you know, I didn't like and my mother didn't like either, you know? Do you know how many incidents there were where you and her got into any, like, physical confrontations or anything like that? Uh, there could, could have been a one or two here and there, but mostly it's always a verbal, you know, like, oh, what do you think these people over, you know, you know, they don't belong here, like, this is not a hangout, you know, bringing, you know, multiple, you know, teenagers over here, like, this is a hangout, you know, no respect or anything, you know. Then after that, it might, you know, got a physical here one day, you know, pushing or, you know, hitting maybe once or twice. Did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? Not really. All my crime started right after, you know, um, you know, when I started doing the Zodiac stuff. Before we get into your crimes, tell me about your fascination with the Zodiac Killer and when it all started. Yeah, well, it all started, you know, I was, you know, because I got kicked out of high school, so, you know, it was not really doing so I guess watching TV, and I, they had this show on, on serial killers, and this uh, person named Zodiac Killer came up, and what, what, what caught my eye and interest was that, he was never caught, and uh, he terrorized the whole city, just one person. You know, in my mind, you know, after thinking, you know, after some time thinking, you know, I can do this, you know. I have the, the skills which I acquire from learning stuff from the, from the military. I could do the same thing he did, you know. And I started, you know, you know, getting uh, information on how to plan and, started doing the my zip guns and testing and stuff like that. So this was around the age of 16 after you were kicked out of high school? Yeah, probably, if I could recall, around the, yeah, the early years, and I started preparing myself. Did you have any type of hobbies as you grew out of your teenage years? No, well, I started collecting, like, stamps, coins, and baseball cards. You know, and, you know, as time goes on, you know, I just moved, I moved, like, from, like, baseball cards to coins to uh, stamps. Were you collecting any type of weapons at the time? Uh, not, not, well, at, after high school, I started, like, you know, acquiring as much as I can. I was buying, like, tear gases, small grenades, you know, fuses, you know, from um, catalogs that they had at that time. I was buying ammunition. Because I was preparing myself, because I already made a decision. I was going to do the same thing that uh, California Zodiac did. When did you decide that you were going to go through with it? Yeah, after uh, you know a week or two thinking about it, because I I had nothing to do, and and I just had, you know I'm not going to die just here. You like and nobody like recognized me or anything, you know. So you were about what seventeen, eighteen, nineteen when you decided that you you were going to recreate his crimes in New York City. Yeah, probably around that time. Before we talk about the actual Zodiac murders and shootings in New York, were there any other criminal activities that you committed prior to the first shooting that you can recall? I don't think I ever did. I mean, I jumped a train on Turnstile, whatever I did, that's it. <laughs> I used to jump the train and then uh, other than that, I really didn't do nothing, you know? Other than the crimes and the jumping the dust out, that's it. <laughs> Between 1968 and 1987, someone calling himself the Zodiac claimed responsibility for up to 40 murders. Now, three shootings in New York, none fatal. A writer to the New York Post claims responsibility. 
The letter contains astrological signs in strange writing. Quote, this is the zodiac. The 12 sign will die when the belts in the heaven are seen. A source at the New York Post says the note doesn't appear similar to the San Francisco Zodiac letters. Let's talk about the New York Zodiac murders, which you're responsible for. And I want to talk about each case in chronological order and any crimes that you might have committed in between these attacks that might have went unnoticed. So the NYPD in Brooklyn received a letter in November of 1989 from the Zodiac Killer, or so what they thought was a Zodiac Killer. Tell me about the first letter that was written to the NYPD. It's so long, it's so long ago, I can't even remember, you know, which one you're talking about. You know, you got to understand, you know, I, I try not to dwell on, on these, uh, on my crime so much. Because I'm not like, you know, interested or fascinated, or, you know, or I'm stuck on crime like some other people, whatever. You know, unless you could refresh me on like exactly which letter, you know. Because I wrote so many letters, I, I can't recall myself which letter exactly you want to talk about. But I did write letters to the media police, you know, after I, I did, like, a shooting or whatever. I believe this is the first letter that you wrote. You said, this is the Zodiac, the 12 sign will die soon when the belts in heaven are seen. The first sign is dead on March 8th, 1990, 1.45 a.m. White man with cane shoot on the back in the street so on and so forth, and it's signed off with no more games pigs, all shot in Brooklyn with 380 or 9 millimeter, no grooves on bullet. That was the first letter that you wrote. Do you remember that now? Yeah, I a letter, but yeah. Obviously, you were inspired by the Zodiac to write this letter, but everything that you wrote in the letter, you know, what inspired you to write everything that you did, you know, hearing, uh, you know, that back? Mostly, uh, I just got it from the from the original one. Try to you know duplicate it as as close to as I can, you know. And when I when I went out that night, I just went around for hours, you know, looking for a, a certain place. And this person came up, and it, it felt like the right time. And I approached him, and and I shot him. When you were writing that first letter, did you take any type of precautions or think of taking precautions like wearing gloves or because I know the the California Zodiac Killer claimed, I believe he was w wearing some type of polish on his fingers so he wouldn't leave any fingerprints uh -huh. or anything of the sort. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I sometimes I wear gloves, you know, and you know, not, I know about fingerprints, so I try to avoid not touching the paper too much. But I think in one incident, it's one fingerprint. I don't know how that got there, but. You know, I always try to avoid not to get my fingerprints on the paper, but somehow one did get on the paper, you know, and, they, you know, when they arrested me, they, they masked it or, or whatever. Take me back to March 8th, 1990. Tell me everything you remember about that day from sunup to sundown uh, with victim number one. Uh, it, it, like I said, you know, before, I, I cannot remember, <laughs> you know, you have to like guide me because uh, this is so long ago. Uh, you know, I don't think about the time or anything. You know, you, you give me a day, I have no idea. What, you know, exactly what I did. I'm not. You know, I did the shooting, but I. I you know, every step is like it take a while for my memory to figure out in my head what exactly I did. Everything. Uh, well, um, majority of my shooting mostly I I just walk around and try to find out like the most quiet, quiet place, or if somebody is walking around, see if this person goes to a quiet, a quiet part of or whatever, where, where he's walk, walking, and then when it's time or it feels right, I just walk up to them, you know, and, and shoot them. Were you wearing plain clothes, or were you wearing the Zodiac mask, or were you, were you doing anything to conceal your identity when you were out there? Yeah, mostly I was wearing like all black, you know, and I had a, a black bandana over my face. Was that in every single shooting you had a bandana over your face? Yeah, yeah, mostly the same the same outfit. It was dark, you know, black, black or whatever. After you shot Mario, the first victim, were you confident that you had killed him? Well, I assume, Mario, because I, I think in the letter I said I, I did. I'm not sure if the letter said I did or didn't, but, you know, I, I, I'm sure I was confident, you know, but you know, with those uh, zip guns, they're not, they're not, they're not reliable or accurate to uh, to do that. After that first shooting, did you contact any media or law enforcement? Uh, 
No, mostly all my content was by uh, letter, by mail. Right, right. Yeah, that's what I mean. After the after the first shooting, did you send any letters in? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I did. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know before, or after. I'm not sure, but probably afterwards, I, I sent some letters or whatever. How long after the shootings would you send the letters? Uh, I cannot remember exactly. Probably could be day afterwards or maybe a couple of days afterwards or something like that. Hmm. After that first shooting took place, were you eager or excited to get out there and do the next one? Yeah, but, but this is, you gotta say, because, you know, once this started, it's like, I kept going outside, stalking and stalking. It's like it never stopped. Like, I go out at nighttime, just looking, looking, looking. Even though I didn't shooting, I just kept like, I stayed in my house for some time, but after some time, I just went back outside. And looking for the next victim, and when the time is right, it just happens. And you would be out there stalking sometimes and not even shooting anybody, just what it, no, it, it wasn't it, the right it, circumstances? It, 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 it just, I guess, for the students, right, it, it happens, you know. I used to go out there days, 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 you know, nonstop, like, never find nobody, like, you know. And then when the time is right, it just happens, I don't know, it's like, you know, this person, you know, like, just start following the person and, and then just do it. Can you recall anything that took place with your second shooting, which was March 29th, 1990, he was victim number two? Uh, I think I can recall a little bit. I think that was, uh, yeah, I remember following him. He was walking around at nighttime. I think he was about to go to his, uh, his apartment or to his building or whatever. And I walked behind him and, and I shot him. Did you guys have any words before you shot him or did you just... I think so. I can't remember. I think I might have asked him for something, maybe. Like if he had something, I don't know. And then after that, I think I just I said, I, I shot him or whatever. Did you send any letters after that shooting? Yeah, I always do. I always send the letters, yeah. So you sent a letter after every single shooting? Yeah, I think I sent them maybe to police and uh, the newspapers. Did you commit any other type of crimes after that second shooting, or after the first shooting for that matter, prior to your third shooting? No, my crime was uh, just those shootings, you know, other than jumping a trust down, that's about it. So you never committed anything in between any of the, the murders or the shootings? Oh. You know, I, you know, between those, the, you know, the shootings, I might have set some cars on fire. That's about it. You know, you know, there was a bad car and I just set them on fire a couple of times. That's about it. You know, most of my crimes are just the shootings. You know, the major. Were you following the news coverage of the first two cases at the time? Yeah, I was looking at the TV. You know. Did it anger you that the victim survived? No, not really. Because I got my objective, my objective, my point got across, you know. Now they know I'm here, you see what I'm saying? So now they're going to pay attention, like, oh, somebody out there, you know, that's me. I mean, it, it was the wrong thing, you know, when I think about it now, you know. But, you know, my thinking was not the same as it is right now than that it was then, you know be selfish or whatever it's just you know you want people to recognize you you know and now <laughs> I got all this attention I don't want the recognition you see what I'm saying it's like reverse so at the time when you were watching the news coverage on these shootings was it almost like entertainment to you being that you were the one responsible and they didn't know that you did it but you were watching it unfold in front yeah. of you yeah, I was watching it, but I wasn't like, you know, cheering or, you know, happy or anything like that. I just listened to it and I went about my uh, my, my daily business, you know. It was just like, it just happened, you know. I just continued working on it, you know, doing, preparing for my uh, next my next shooting and, and that's it. What would you do to prepare? I was going to test my guns, you know, I, you know. I, I tested and fired, I think, about nine or ten different calibers from homemade guns. I even made a, I made a 223 Remington, which I actually made fire from a zip gun. Not everything. I, mean, I, I, I shot a 22 short, a 22 LR, 
32 auto, 380 auto, 9 millimeter Luger, 45 auto, a 410 shotgun, a 44 Magnum, and 38 special, and uh, 223 Remington. I successfully made a zip gun for each one and, fi and fire it. I mean, not all of them were good, but the best ones to use, which I always like, was the 45 auto and my and the, and the 410, 410 shotgun. Now, my, well, my favorite was the 45 and the, and the 410, which I never got a chance to use because I, I, there was a little bulky to carry around, being bigger and heavier. So mostly I wind up using the, like the 22 and the 380. They were lighter and more compact. Was the same gun used in all of these shootings? Well, the 22 was uh, the, the same one. And the, well, I, I, had, um, I had multiple uh, zip guns. I had some duplicates, so I can't tell you, you know, I have barrels for, you know, so they were all interchangeable, so it's hard to say, but I had like maybe five or six handguns, I had like one derringer, or two derringers, and I had like, or I could take the zip guns and convert it to a, a, like a long rifle version. Is that what you were doing in between shootings? Were you just creating new guns or modifying them? Yeah, Testing new calibers, which ones are more effective, you know, testing them, you know, getting more, more, you know, you know, more different calibers to see which one's better, not better, which one's more effective, you know. I just them in my house, I, I used to get like a, a bunch of telephone books, put them together, and take like a bunch of blankets, roll them up, and make a hole in the middle, put, put the, the barrel in the middle so it muffles the noise, and fire it. Yeah, let's talk about victim number four, Larry Parham, June 19th, 1990. That was the gentleman that was shot in the chest that survived. Yeah, that was a time when everything was getting a little hectic, and I couldn't walk around where I was doing most of the other shooting. So I had to find some other place to uh, to look, you know, to do it. I just went to, you know, I went, you know, to Central Park and looking around, waiting at nighttime, I just see this guy just laying there, so... I waited till everybody else like left. There was like no people around, and I walked up to him and, and shot him. How long did you wait there? You know, late late at night. I was waiting, but there was people still around. You know, around you know around walking around. So I had to wait. You know, probably hours until like everybody left. And once it was like nobody, I snuck up and shot him. And I think I left. Uh, did I, I left a note there? Maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, a lot of time I, I, I left notes at the scene of the shootings, too. Was that just to add to the thrill of, of the, the investigation? And the... I, tried to, I tried to mimic the same thing like Zodiac, because he was, you know, in somebody shooting, like, he left messages to, for the police. Mm -hmm. I was doing the same thing he was trying to do. Like, in one of the, in the, the Zodiac in California, he left a, you have a message. Left. He left a message on the door that he, he committed these crimes in the past. You were just trying to imitate him as much as possible to the team? Yeah. yeah, mimic, you know, him as much as I can. The police have a theory that the shootings are being carried out in the form of the constellation Orion, the hunter in the sky. According to that theory, the next attack is due July 26th, another Thursday, and that the target will be a Leo. But only the man who calls himself the Zodiac knows for sure. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about May 31st, 1990, and that was Joseph Prost. Uh, he was shot in his lower back, and, and it hit his kidney, and he's the one that survived but died later on in the hospital. I know it was so long ago, but, but when that happened and when he passed away in the hospital, like when hearing that or seeing that on TV, was it just like, eh, whatever, like it didn't phase you, or did, did you think anything of it? Not really, you know, because my objective was to uh, to accomplish, you know, just being recognized, not really, you know, if they survive or not survive. Were you holding a job down at all while terrorizing uh, New York City? No, I never had no jobs or anything. At any time. I kept in my house, which I think it was uh, it was good, because if I was working out there, somebody might have recognized me, and I, I would have been caught probably a long time ago. What about the August 10th, 1992 attack of Patricia Fonte or Font? She was the one that was shot twice and stabbed over a hundred times. 
Is that what, is that the, the first incident or the, uh, or the or the second incident? This is the one, two, three, four, fifth incident. I'm, I'm talking about you know because I, I did two phases. You know, one phase I stopped. Is this that? Uh... I'm glad you mentioned that. So the fourth shooting was in 1990, and then the next shooting was okay, in 1992. Was... So why did you okay. why, why did you take a two year break in between yeah, you know it was, shootings? It was getting it was getting kind of high and everything. So I thought you know it's time to cool down. So I started cooling down. You know, I said I ain't doing no more for a while. You know? Did you ever but, think about I, stopping completely? No, nah, not really, you know. I just, like, cooled down and wait until the right time came up, you know. And But when, you know, listening to the media, which I was doing, and the police and everything, you know, I changed my whole M.O. Because uh, the, the first phase of my shooting, I was uh, leaving messages. Every time I did a shooting, I left a message right there at the scene, and then I wrote the media and everything. But my second one, I was going to change my whole M.O., make it more difficult for them to like, you know, to, to try to find me. So when I started my, my second phase is I didn't leave no, no messages, you know, in the shooting and I didn't write, I didn't write no media, no police. What I did is I racked up a, a bunch of shootings. Once I had enough shootings, I did it all in one shot and that gave them like more of an effect. Was the effect Patricia Fonte, the one that was shot twice and stabbed a hundred times? Yeah, with that one, I use a small caliber, so it was like, you know, small calibers don't really, uh, they don't take you down, or they don't create too much damage, so, you know, she was still moving, and I had to, like, you know, after I shot her, I had to use my uh, knife. So you stabbed her over a hundred times? Say, I always, I always say, there's no way I, I stabbed her, because I'm sure they didn't find the body two days later. I think somebody else must have came around there, some other person, and... They want. They had to have stabbed them, stab her. Cause there's no way. I mean, if I did, I, I would have recorded it. You know, I'm not. You know, hundred times. I'll, I'll be. I'll be there like twenty minutes doing that. Hundred times. I make no sense. You know, I did it probably a, a few times. No, no, hundred times. That'll be somebody else that, that came past. You know, whenever they found the body days later, somebody was walking around there and they had to have stabbed her. You know, multiple times. But I have no recollection of, of doing that. I know I only did it a few times, not no freaking 100 times. Not a good memory. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't do drugs. I don't drink or, no, or nothing. There's no way I, I, I did it 100 times. I have no blackouts, no epilepsy, nothing. There's, there's no way, hey, hey, you know, 100 times. There had to be somebody else that came by and did it. You know, and, it, you know, they try to play it on me. You know? The next attack would be a little less than a year later. It'd be about nine, ten months. Why did you stop then, you know, for almost a year? Yeah, you know, I, I was changing my whole MO. You know, I wasn't, like, doing it as fast as I did, you know, in, in my uh, my first phases of the shooting. You know, I was changing my MO. I was, you know, I tried to, throw, tried to throw police off not to, like, do the same thing over. This is the reason I, I didn't, I didn't left, left no messages in my second my second phase of the shootings, you know, I just, you know, to make it, you know, give me a better chance of, of not getting caught. You know, I changed my whole MO, you know, that's what I was doing, you know. Everything flipped, and, and I, I proved it that you look at the first phase and the second phase, it's totally different. But, they, you know, if they knew it was me, how come they didn't say in, in, in the, when the first shooting of the second phase is? Because they didn't knew. They only knew when I told them after I accumulated a whole bunch of shootings. So it worked, you know? The next attack following the murder of Patricia Font was James Weber, and he was shot in the buttocks. Do you recall that incident? Yeah, I can't remember exactly um, in my mind how it looks. Let's move on to the next one, which is a little over a month later, and that was John Diacone, and he actually passed away from his injuries. He was shot in the head at close range. Do you remember that one? That was the last one that passed away. Uh, that one, like, that was in, like, in a park in the highway area. Yeah, I seen him walking, and I approached him, and, and I shot him. Did you say anything to him, or did you just shoot him upon coming up to him? No, I just, I just walked from behind and quickly and, and shot him. So you were standing behind him. Was it almost like execution no, what, style? Uh, it was. Uh, in, it was in a park. He was like, you know, 
there's a uh, like a reservoir. The reservoir can see in front, the front of the uh, well, not front, but on the on one side you can see like highways. It's uh, like a pedestrian place, and I can just watch people coming and going. You know, it was late at night. He just like walking. He was going under a br- uh, like a little bridge and a little pathway on on the on the path, and I just seen them, and there was nobody else. And I think uh, you know it was for the right time. I just ran across the highway and to the other side of, of the the sidewalk, snuck up and and I shot him and I ran and went home. With that shooting or any other shooting up until that point in time, did you ever get any like excessive blood or you know anything on your clothes or your face or anything at the time you were running away? No, I never seen anything, anything on my clothes, no. The next incident that took place after the murder of John Diacone was October 2nd, 1993, and that was Diane Ballard, and uh, she was shot in the neck, but the bullet had missed her vital arteries, but it was lodged against her spine. Do you remember this shooting, the shooting yeah. before your sister? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, this one, when she was walking in the park, I seen her, and I think I walked behind her, and I shot her. So no words were exchanged, you just shot her upon seeing her? No, but I was hiding, you know, nobody really sees me, but I'm in a park and I'm hiding, you know, and I'm in a park, I'm walking around, nobody really sees me. I always see them first, you know. Where would you be hiding at? Oh, because the park is big, like, you know, Highland Park and stuff like that, and, you know, between, you know, there's like big brushes in between, so you can hide in there, and you can see people coming and going, and they won't really see you, especially at nighttime, it's all, it's all dark. You know, I'm wearing black, so nobody really sees me. And I see somebody, and that person looks like the right person, and then I just sneak up behind them and, and shoot them. In March of 1994, you were arrested and booked into custody on unrelated charges. Tell me about those charges, the arrest, and what all came from that. Yeah, that was one of the days that I, I, went, I, I left out my uh, apartment with my uh, one, one of my zip guns, you know, and I left like just two blocks away uh, at the street crimes unit. They just, out of nowhere, they just picked me and stopped me. They told me to put my hands up, you know, guns drawn or whatever, and they searched me and they found one of my zip guns. They booked me, they arrested me. I spent a couple of days in booking or whatever you want to call it. I guess the uh, judge or whoever who did it, my, my thing, uh, they said that the zip gun was inoperable, it could not fire, and they let me go. Was that one of the murder weapons at the time? I think so, yes. I think it was the, the 22. I think it was uh, the 22, if I'm correct. I know it has different calibers, you know, it depends. Sometimes I carry the 22 or the, or the 380 or the 9 millimeter. When you were arrested in 94, did you think it was all over? Yes, because, they, you know, because before this, uh, I knew they have, they were saying, they, I think they, they said they had fingerprints or something, I'm not sure. And, you know, I thought they were going to catch me, but when they released me, I said, oh, you know, you know, I guess not, you know. And then afterwards, when I got arrested for the second time for all this, they're saying they had me, they had me in, in the computer, like, come on, man, what's going on? You can't make up my mind, you, you, you know, you didn't search, search the computer or something. So there was another shooting that took place on June 10th, 1994, that you're not convicted of, but that is linked to you, and that was a white man that was injured after being shot. Do you recall that incident? So what, there was one incident too, which I know I did it, but I think they're just saying that there was no, no records or anything. He's not considered one of your official confirmed victims. Yeah, I know, that's one, I don't know, that's like a weird trick, I don't know what happened, maybe he was lucky, maybe he was shy, maybe, you know, he was shy and just he brushed it off, I, 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 I'm not sure, you know? Do you remember that incident? Did you walk up to him or say anything or shoot yeah, him in the head? I or nothing, I'm not sure what I did, but I just fired the gun and, and, and ran. I'm sorry, I hit him because I was real close to him, there's no way he, he did not get shot, you know? What was your relationship like with your half sister Gladys from 1994 up until summer of 1996? Well, I mean, it, it, it wasn't you know good or bad. It just you know she was more 
she, you know, when she started getting older, she's not really, uh, you know, acting more like a rebellious teenager, you know, and, you know, you couldn't really talk to her, you know, she was just doing whatever, whatever she wanted to do. How did you get along with her boyfriend at the time? Uh, no, really, I didn't know her boyfriend. I, um, I didn't talk to them. I didn't want nobody to talk. I was doing this crime. I didn't want nobody to see me talk. I didn't want to talk to nobody. Like, I want to see anybody. This is why I didn't, I didn't like, you know, her bringing her friends over. I didn't want nobody to see me. <laughs> so you were trying to shut yourself off from the world in order to... Yeah, I got to stay invisible. I got the whole world after me. Like, you know, FBI, everybody, everybody, secret service, everybody looking for me. Like, I, I need people coming to my apartment, like, to see me. Like, I really want to, like, go to jail right now because of some dummy, you know? Tell me about the incident that took place with Gladys and her boyfriend on June 18th, 1996. There was a shooting and then a shootout with police, and I'm sure you would have to remember that, right? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, she brought her boyfriend over. You know, this was, like, a, like I said, a continuing her rebellion, and she brought him over. I told her, you know, he bring these guys over, you know, did, you know, little argument, blah, 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 blah. I got tired of this. I went to get my gun to try to shoot him, but it 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 it, it shot her. They were kind of close, you know. And then I went to get more ammunition, you know. But he barricaded himself in one of the rooms, but my sister crawled out into the uh, one of the uh, outside. She crawled outside and called the called knocked on uh, one of the apartments next to her, and they called the police. Whatever. I heard the police coming, so I said, oh shit, oh hell is gonna break loose. So I started taking out all my uh, ammunition, zip guns, I have pipe bombs in there too. Pipe bombs, hand grenades, everything. So I started taking all that out. I knew it was like, you know, World War Three about to start. So I heard the police, you know, I heard the police coming you know, into the building and I just started firing at them. I was firing from like three different locations. Did you use every single weapon at your disposal? Yeah, we're using all my different calibers. You know, I didn't get to use the the bombs yet, but it was like shooting from like the front, the side, the back, front, side, back. And then I guess they call it like the SWAT team or whatever you are you. Was it your intentions to not go to jail that day to die in a shootout with police? Well, I was thinking kind of like that because then uh, I was thinking of like blowing up the whole building or something. Did you think that it would add to your infamy of getting a shootout with police and being the New York Zodiac? And Well, I wasn't thinking at that time, but afterwards, probably it would have, you know, elevated my, uh, my status, a, you know, a little bit. After the shooting stopped, what happened after that when it came to your arrest? Well, I mean, it, well, I mean after the shooting, you know, everything, there was a hostage situation because, uh, the guy, he barricaded himself in one of the, uh, one of the rooms. I wouldn't even pay attention to him. I would pay attention to the police. Then the police, you know, they want to negotiate, blah, blah. I don't know. I would have to, I don't know how, how many hours afterwards, you know. I, I, I just say, oh, let, let, me, let, me, let me surrender. I had enough for this, you know. They lowered a bucket down the window and I put all the guns in there. And then I, I opened the door and they arrested me. So at the time, you were just charged with aggravated assault or something of the sort for shooting your your sister in the shootout with police. And... Yeah, yeah. That case, I was just charged with that one. I I I think I admitted doing it because I was there. There's no point in me, you know, saying I didn't do it. You know, but I, I made a dumb mistake of putting some kind of symbol on a piece of paper, which one of the detectives that was investigating the Zodiac. He recognized the sort of suspicions and he started looking into it more. That was actually going to be my next question was, did you intentionally put that symbol on there when you wrote that statement up? No, it, it just came, I don't know, I guess my mind was like some other dimension or whatever. And it's just like, you when you're writing, you just, actually just do it. Did that become like habit while you were doing the shootings was to just keep using those symbols with everyday things you would do? Yeah, the symbol at the time, you know, I, you know, people say, like, I talked to these victims and got their their signs some way, or I took their wallets, and uh, that never happened. It just, you know, maybe one in a billion that happens, it just came to my mind, or maybe I was possessed. I don't know, I don't know you know. All these theories that the people talk about, it just, I just put it down. 
You know, maybe I was possessed by some unknown force that, you know, because I didn't know that. How, 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 how did I, I get all these, these signs, people? I must be the luckiest man in the whole world or something. <laughs> I just, like, just wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down, and I was correct. After you were arrested for shooting your sister and the hostage situation and so on and so forth, police began to use Tuamark evidence to link you to the New York Zodiac attacks, contrary to what you said in one of your letters to police that it wouldn't be able to be traced. And they also found fingerprint evidence that you left behind, as well as doing the handwriting analysis that you spoke about, finding symbols on there. After everything was discovered, and the cat was out of the bag, you know, what was your response to that? How did you process that? Well, you got to see at this time, because like I, I told you before, because I, I, I was changing, because I was, was curious of why these things happened. So I started like, you know, looking at TV and looking at the religious shows and, and they're telling you that, you know, we, we, we you know, you do, there's, there's forces out there that, that manipulate people, get into people's minds and, and stuff like that. You know, we're in a warfare. Not in a, we're not in a war with ourselves. We, you know, we're in a war with, with the devil and his demons, you know? And me really, really trying to understand, you know, after some time, you know, I, I believe it. And, you know, and, you know, after I'm reading, because there's a Bible when I was in my apartment, so I started reading, you know, that Bible and listening to shows, radios, and, and, and stuff like that, that it hits me that, you know, even though I committed these, tr these crimes, you know, I know there's, a, there's an evil force out there. Not only the crimes that I committed, you know, that, that, are, that are horrible, that, that I, can, I can still escape this and, and, you know, and save myself, you know, that, that somebody died. You know, you, know, uh, you know, this person, Jesus Christ, he died for my sin. You know, all I have to do is recognize him and change my ways, you know. You know, from the, from the last shooting, I was I was little by little, you know, changing. I was going to church. I was going to Saint Fortunato Church. You can verify this, uh, Father Cintron and Father Ryan. You know, I was going there. Uh, uh, Father Cintron came to see me in I think Kings County Hospital. You know, little by little, I was going to change. You know, I wasn't going to do it forever. You know, I realized that what I was doing was wrong, and I could stop. You know, and I can escape, you know, what I'm doing. Even though I still, I live in, in this in this earth, you know, this is just temporary. You know, whatever happens here, I really don't care. You know, because I, I, I believe in, in, you know, in Jesus Christ that, you know, I confess to him, and, and little by little I was changing, I was going to church, and I was gonna put this away. It would've came, it would've came one day, I would've throw all these guns in, in the garbage, and I would just would've left, you know, live my life. But because the incident with my sister, I, I guess the devil had to throw his last two pennies in, and that incident just came out of nowhere, and psh, it just propelled me into the, the media. When you were finally arrested, the media was putting a, a name and face to the New York Zodiac killings, and your name was popping up everywhere, and your name was in the news, you know, worldwide. Were you happy that you were getting recognition? Like the Zodiac in California got? Not really. That that never really like you know. That's not my focus. You know, I, I'm not really like an, an attention person. Like oh yeah, yeah 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 you know like anything like that. But actually, it was a relief. I was happy I got arrested. Cause this is uh this is stressful. You know, cause it, it, you know be living in my apartment is stressful because every little know you don't know with the police. You don't know they're coming after you. You don't know, you know, you know, you don't know what's going on. You know, I'm living in a crime infected, uh, you know, building, neighborhood. You know, I had problems with drug dealers and everything around there. You know, and I had to confront them several times. It's chaos. I had to fire my gun in my uh, uh, from my building, trying to scare them away. You know, so that happened several times. Right? You know, I, I mean, I would say I'm happy I got arrested. I got away from this this evil place that I've been living so long, it was like a relief. So, you know, when it happened, I was happy. You know, I could get away from that, you know, and I don't have to deal with that no more. So throughout your trial, there were multiple outbursts on your behalf. Do you remember all the outbursts and what all you had said and done at that time? I didn't say nothing in the court. I didn't even say nothing. A lot of times I didn't even, I didn't even went into the court. 
my lawyer probably was doing everything, but these stupid lawyers, they're the, the cheap ass AT and T lawyers. They don't do nothing, you know. I never really said nothing. I, if I did, it was probably only one time, but not no outbursts or anything. A lot of time I just stay inside the the bullpen, waste my time. I mean, just throw the key away, leave me alone. All this nonsense, all this uh, trials and this stupid shit. Like, like really, bro. Like, I had to be in there for, for what? No reason. So you didn't speak during your trial? Uh, I don't think so. No, mostly I stayed in the bullpen. Yeah, after some time, I got tired of coming outside to the to the, the courts, sitting there. I ain't coming out here no more. Were there any victim impact statements read by the families of the victims at your trial or after your sentencing or conviction? Uh, well, no, I wasn't in there. I, I didn't hear anything at any time. You've never had any victims, families in front of you, you know, reading statements to you or anything of the sort? Nope. If you were able to address any of the victims' families, do you know what you might say, I know, 30 plus years later? You know, everyone would say, you know, like, you know, you know, apologize, anything, you know, that's not going to make up for anything, you know? I always say, if you, if you really want to o- overcome this tragedy, Read the Bible. You know, that will help you. If you cannot understand it, you know, overcome it with, with the Bible and believe it. If you cannot believe it, you're never going to overcome it. You're going to be in pain and suffering for the rest of your life. You got to read the Bible, and if you believe it, you will overcome it if you understand how everything works. The Bible tells you everything that's going on in this world, every little problem, why it's happening. I don't know why people don't listen to it. No other book tells you everything that's going to happen, what happens, is going to happen. How people think and everything is in the Bible, how to deal with it, you know? So on June 24th, 1998, you were convicted by a jury and you were sentenced to 232 years in prison. How did you feel when you were handed down your sentence? I I I don't know if I was in there or not, but... I didn't think about it. I already knew it was going to jail, jail for a long time. Did you think that you would get out one day? No. When the sunshine goes home, then I have a, a, a good chance of going home. He has not gone home yet. He did it before me, so when he goes home, if he doesn't go home, I don't go home. There's something that you've said prior to the murders that's always fascinated me. And I don't know if it's true or not, maybe you can clear this up, but you said to somebody, I'm going to start killing people because I'm not getting no sex. Do you remember saying this? I talk to, I, 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 I kept to myself, like I have no friends or nothing, so I said, I talk to nobody, so how can I make a statement like that to anybody? You know, I never made, I never made a statement like that to anybody, you know? If I did, I would have to be, have to be dumb, you know? Did you talk to anybody like in depth about the Zodiac killer at the time, like before the murders? No, I, nobody. It was all done by myself. Did you feel like you were burying like a big, deep, dark secret with this, you know, like obsession or, or something of this sort with the Zodiac killer? Like, like you couldn't tell anybody and you felt you had to either show people because you couldn't tell anybody about it? similarities between yourself and the California Zodiac Killer? It, it, it will go, you know? 
researching your case and the Zodiac's case, obviously, ever since I was a, a young child, there's quite a few inconsistencies in your case compared to the Zodiac in California. So were you trying to recreate his crimes perfectly, or were you just trying to be content with going out to kill in the name of the Zodiac, even if it wasn't, you know, identical, you know, the same amount of time stabbing somebody or shooting somebody or, you know, their, their Zodiac sign or what have you? Well, I was trying to duplicate as much as I, as I, I can on the Zodiac in California because I was looking at TV, so I only had like a, you know, 30 minutes or I don't, I don't, I don't know how long the show was, 30 minutes or one hour, and how to get as much information, and I took whatever was there in that, that, that documentary on TV and memorized it and took as much as I can try to duplicate it. You know, I didn't have like the whole blueprint, so I couldn't like duplicate everything, but I, I, I accomplished as much as I can, you know, trying to make people think and take his identity and stuff like that. Right, because the reason I ask you that is I'm on liquidsearch.com slash Herberto Seda uh, victims and two of your victims, Joseph Prost and Diane Ballard, they're both Tauruses. Did you know that they had the same zodiac sign? No, I never knew any, any, any of my victims their signs. I never talked to them, I didn't take the wallet, I didn't do anything, nothing like that. It just popped to my head, you know, when I went home, I started writing the next day the, my messages to the media and the police, and they just come to my mind, and I just put it down, and send it to the police and media, and for some reason, it came out to be correct, you know? So would you say the biggest difference between you and the New York Zodiac is he'd be more like, the whole infamous or famous thing with Zodiac, right, is he was, he was researching his victims right there birth dates and zodiac signs, he wanted to kill one of each each sign, correct? Yeah, I wanted to do one, you know, one for each, you know, just to, you know, give it the connection with the zodiac and stuff like that. So were you less interested in killing one of each zodiac sign and more just interested in just killing in general? I was more, I mean, the, the killing thing really, the, the, the main point is, is, is just accomplishing, you know, for each sign, you know, or, 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 or shooting, you know, get connected to it. So basically just in his name, like, you <laughs> just, you wanted to be known, in theory, as an on-the-loose killer that everybody thought was the, the California Zodiac then, right? You wanted people to believe that you were the real Zodiac? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, I want to be known, but, you know, in this big case, I, I know it was going to be a last long, and, you know, they started using my name, uh, the Zodiac Coffee Cat. Did that upset you when they called you a copycat and not the real thing? No, I was suspecting it, you know, but, you know, but, you know, I, I accomplished what I accomplished. It's trying to make people think that he, he came back, and, and, you know, I accomplished my, what I accomplished is to uh, make myself known that I'm capable of, of doing this, you know, you know, these kind of things that I can plan and, 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 and execute it, you know? Do you think you accomplished something good? No, at that time, it probably I'm gonna say yes, but now and then no. If you had a time machine, say going back to let's say 1979, would you go back and and not not go down the road of being consumed with a Zodiac killer and wanting to recreate his crimes, or do you think it was inevitable that you just wanted to recreate one of the most infamous serial killers, you know, of all times crimes? Yeah, if I could go back, I'd change it, but you know. It's impossible, you know, to change it. You know, I, 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 I choose my destiny, and I have to live with it. You know, and that's what I can do. Have you ever had any interactions with any of your, you know, victims' family members or anybody that's related to them or friends of them or anything? Being that the prison system is big but small in a roundabout way. Nah, uh, nope. Would you be afraid if you did? How do you spend your time in prison these days? Well, mostly I wake up in the morning, you know, I turn my TV on, try to look at the news, you know, what's going on, and look, look, look for some shows, you know, some science shows, that, you know, educational show, and I do exercise in the morning, and I eat it myself, you know, three morning breakfast and lunch, I eat it myself, and look at TV, and read or write, you know, check, check my uh, kiosk, you know, and, 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 and that's about it. At night time, you know, I work at 11 o'clock and I, I get to bed. 
do you do anything in these days in regards to like Zodiac, like any Zodiac signs or research the Zodiac killer case in California or? killers and infamous killers at one point during your incarceration you became romantically involved with an infamous murderer Cynthia China Blast how did you two meet and end up hitting it off and are you guys still together and or in contact with one another about this at the beginning of our interview, but uh, do you think there's been any misconceptions of you or the Zodiac, the California Zodiac for that matter, in the media? California Zodiac never did get caught. Does it ever upset you that, like, you think about recreating his crimes and he might still be out there now or he, he might be dead? I, I think he'd be in his 90s to this day. Does it upset you that you got arrested and, and he, he got away? Attempted to uh, decode the letters that the Zodiac killer sent to authorities in California? specifically that wasn't released to the public. Leonardo, he uh, did codes, and I 
I think I seen a magazine, and I hit his code, and I started doing messages uh, with his code, and I put them on, on, on napkins. I think when you hear not on, you hear not on the bitch. His meaning is, I wrote something on it, I just can't remember what, what it was, so long no, time ago. You know, I wrote something there, I just can't remember. This, this letter is like, but you have to break it down, you have to have the code to uh, decipher it or whatever. If you had the opportunity to speak to the California Zodiac Killer, what is the one question you would ask him? I don't know, that's a hard question. I have to think on that one. Because it's something like, just don't pop out of my mind, you know? It's like, like you know, it's like we both standing next to each other to like infamous person. I don't know what I would say. What's one thing that you would ask him then? Do you feel like you would be too starstruck or something to, to, to speak to him? Not starstruck, it's just that, that, you know, it's like two powerful people, like, you know, getting together, and, and, you know, you know, we probably, you know, if we, if we next to each other, you probably, you know, we probably start interacting, maybe, or whatever, but it's just like, I cannot think right now, like, what would I say to somebody like that? Uh, yeah, there's something you don't think that's like, you know, two powerful people standing next to each other, and like, like, what would you say, you know? <laughs> would you be curious how he got away with it? Oh, yeah, probably ask a question, like, techniques or whatever, you know, this and that, you know, how he did his stuff and not to get caught and stuff like that. If your half-sister Gladys were to be listening, is there anything that you might want to say to her? That was my interview with Ariberto Eddie Seda, the New York Zodiac. If you enjoyed this interview, hit that thumbs up button, leave a rating, and or subscribe. Head on over to UnforbiddenTruthPodcast.com and keep up to date with everything related to Unforbidden Truth. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden Truth. I'm, 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 Unforbidden Truth. Truth.